Well, welcome everyone. I'm Mary Jo Mihalich. I didn't introduce myself when I first stood up here, and I'd like to welcome you to the uh, high blood pressure prevention and management training for community health workers. Again, it's exciting to see all of you here today. Um, Shirley, do you want to just move ahead to the one slide and we'll quickly go over the objectives. So today we will be going over four different things. The first one is uh, describing high blood pressure and why it's important for people to know their numbers. Um, secondly, we'll be talking about risk factors for high blood pressure. We'll be looking at and talking about the community health worker's role in prevention and managing high blood pressure. And then lastly, we'll be going over um, some community resources, because that a, that's a real key thing with the work that you do, is connecting your patients and clients to the various resources. So we'll wrap up with that. Blood pressure. We work in public health. So, you know, we always have uh, data behind the work that we do. So I'm going to start out with just a few statistics about blood pressure. And then we'll go into what is blood pressure. So in your participant guide, we are on page five. It should say high blood pressure basics at the top of the page. Most of the information is in the participant's guide versus the slides. So nationally, nearly one out of three adults have high blood pressure. So that's a third of the US population, adult population has high blood pressure. And only about half of those people with high blood pressure have it under control. So again, nationally, about 50% of the people with high blood pressure have it under control. Um, in Minnesota, there is about 27% of the adult population report that they have high blood pressure. So in Minnesota alone, that's over a million people. So if you think nationally, you know, if you have 33% you know, of the adult population, that's an enormous number. Um, in Minnesota alone, we have over a million people with high blood pressure. And um, of those, about 77% report that they're taking medications to control their blood pressure. And then again, of that 27% that have high blood pressure, about 75% have it under control within about a year of being diagnosed. Um, so we're doing better than the national average. Again, the national average, about 50% of the people have it under control, and at Minnesota, we're at about 75%. Of course, we know that there are populations where that number is lower, and some populations it may be higher. So we still have work to do in this area. We can't um, rest on our laurels. We would really love to see that 75% go up into the 80%, the 90% would be wonderful. So what is blood pressure? So we need to have blood pressure that keeps us alive. Um, blood pressure is the force of the blood against the walls of your arteries as your blood pumps. So your blood is pumping, it's forcing that blood throughout your body. And again, we need that blood pressure to get the blood to our brains, to our feet, so we can, so we can live. If your blood pressure goes up and stays up, if it's high, that can cause health problems. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. You can see on the screen that when we talk about blood pressure and blood pressure numbers, we talk about it with two numbers. The top number is the systolic number, and on the screen that's the 120. And that is the number where your blood or your heart is pushing that blood out to your body. So it's when your heart's contracting, you get that upper number. It's that force of it pushing it through. That lower number, again in the example on the screen, the 80, is the diastolic pressure. And that's the number that you get when your heart rests. So again, that systolic, that first number is what that force of it pushing it out. The second number is when your heart is resting between beats. Um, you usually say 120 over 80. So if um, you're in a clinic or you're helping someone take their blood pressure, typically you say 120 over 80 or you know, 144 over 90. And that is what people are, and that's what they're referring to. Um, Sherry Lee, if you could minimize this and then go to the bottom. We have a video that Sean found that um, she really liked that she has used with patients. And I don't know if you want to set it up a little bit for what you. Yep, so it's a YouTube video I found. I'm always searching YouTube, you know, for examples from other CHWs around the country and even around the world just to get ideas and learn what, you know, my fellow CHWs are doing. So I came across this video. It's about four and a half minutes long. I love it. I mean, I, and, and I've, 
um, showing it to patients and it kind of helps them really understand what is going on with the blood pressure and why it's so important for them to take their medicine every day at the same time and to really take it seriously. So I hope you like the video as much as I do. Inscape of the body through the pipes of the circulatory system. In any plumbing system, several things can increase the force on the walls of the pipes. The fight or flight response releases hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine that constrict key vessels, increasing the resistance to flow oxygen-starved cells downstream. Staying flexible under pressure is a tough job for arteries. The fluid they pump billion times during an average lifetime. That may sound like an insurmountable amount of pressure, but don't worry. Your arteries are well suited for the challenge. Thank you. Well, great. So what we'll do is um, after this training, we will send out an email to everyone that's here today, and we'll include the link for this video, as, long, as well as um, the link to all of the resources that are in the document, because we know no one wants to have to type in www. So we'll make sure you get all of that. All right, well, thanks, Sean. I'm glad you found that video and were able to share it with us today. So I'm going to just go over some of the things that were in the video. We'll go over it again. Um, so blood pressure numbers. So again, in the video, they talked about the 120 over 80. So when we talk about blood pressure, there's different levels. And what we consider normal is that below 120 over below the 180. So if you're working with um, your patients and clients and their blood pressure is at that or below, you really want to congratulate them on that. Um, talk about maybe ways that they are keeping their blood pressure at that normal level and you know, work, help them work to keep it there. So things, um, your, your healthy eating, your active living, those types of interventions will help them keep that blood pressure in that normal range. Um, as blood pressure starts to go up, again in the video they talked about prehypertension, and that is when the blood pressure starts to go up um, to about 120 to that 139 over 80 to 90. At that level, that prehypertension level, People really want to keep an eye on it. Um, they might want to um, step up things like healthy eating, their physical activity, because those things can help bring it back down into that normal range. And then high blood pressure is the third category. And that's when the blood pressure is greater than 140 over 90. And at that point, um, their provider, physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, who's ever treating them in the clinic, uh, may add medications in addition to the lifestyle modifications that they're making. So again, the healthy eating, the physical activity, and medications. Um, if someone's using tobacco, you would also want to talk about tobacco cessation. Those are kind of the four, the four pillars of blood pressure control. So again, it's that healthy eating, physical activity, medication, and then tobacco cessation. So why do we care, or why are we concerned about that high blood pressure. When someone's blood pressure is in the pre or the high, why are we concerned about that? Well, again, uh, to reiterate what was in the video, as your blood pressure goes up, your heart is working harder to get that blood to all, to all parts of your body. Your arteries, they'll begin to stiffen. You can start building up that plaque. I um, mean, it puts you at greater risk for heart disease, heart attack, stroke, um, kidney problems, blindness, as it starts to affect all the, the little tiny arteries in your, in your body, it can affect your vision. So we really do want to you know, keep an eye on that. The thing with blood pressure is it's sometimes known as the silent killer because most people do not have any signs or symptoms of high blood pressure. Many people don't know it's high until um, you know, they're in the clinic or they're at a community screening and someone says, wow, did you know your blood pressure is 160 over 92? And they're like, no, I feel great. So again, it can be that silent killer. So we really want people to know their numbers. Um, people sometimes ask about symptoms, and they're very rare. Things like headaches and nosebleeds, very rare unless your blood pressure is incredibly high, 180, 200 for a systolic number, over 100 for a diastolic number. People may have some symptoms like that. Um, 
I've been asked about things like blood spots, you know, if you get blood spot, spots in your eye, if you get that facial, you know, um, facial flushing. Uh, those could be related to high blood pressure, but it's not always the cause of high blood pressure. So again, if you're working with, um, when you're working with your patients and clients, and they talk about these symptoms, I've been experiencing this flushing, or something's weird with my vision, you really want to encourage them to go to their clinic and be followed up to figure out, you know, what is the cause of that? What's really causing those, those symptoms? Because again, you don't want people, many people again ignore their blood pressure until they have, you know, a heart attack or a stroke. And really the greatest danger is not knowing your numbers. Because once someone knows their numbers, they'll be able to do something about it. Again, they'll be in that normal range and they'll keep, you know, living their healthy lifestyle. If they find out their prehypertension or hypertension, they can then take um, steps to control it and lower it. All right. Well, Sherry Lee and Sean are going to do uh, some exercises and some talking about risk factors for high blood pressure. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you, Mary Jo. So Mary Jo talked about some, um, some risk factors um, that uh, may cause high blood pressure. So what is a risk factor? A risk factor is either it's a condition or habit that makes a person more likely to have a disease or a condition. So for high blood pressure, there are several risk factors. And some of these risk factors are modifiable, which means that you can, uh, you're able to change them. And others are non-modifiable, you're not able to change. So let's talk about the modifiable um, factors. One of the biggest factors that people can do is to pay attention to their diet and lower the sodium. A, a diet with, that is high in salt or sodium um, is, uh, is, very, is one of the modifiable risk factors, and it's, it's dangerous. Most Americans eat more salt than their bodies need. And what happens is too much salt causes the body to, to hold on to fluids. Did you ever eat like a, I don't know, a big thing of potato chips, and then all of a sudden you're, you feel like your fingers are swelling up or maybe, you know, something in your body is swelling up? It's because your body's not, maybe not used to all that salt and you eat, a, you know, a lot of salt. And what, that ha what happens is, is then your blood pressure increases. And so the, if you're constantly eating foods that are high in sodium, um, uh, you know, your blood pressure keeps up high and you can change your diet. Um, so that's why it's important to eat less salt. Now, if you're following along in your participant guide, eating less, less salt. Um, we, we made these <laughs> participant guides for those of you. Sometimes, you know, you're taking notes and you're trying to write everything. So we've tried to put some things in, but then um, to help pay attention a little bit, then you can um, write in the correct, correct answer. So the recommendation is, is to eat less than 2,300 milligrams of salt a day. And, eat, and then also to eat more fruits and vegetables because these fruits and vegetables are low, well, as long as you're not adding salt to them, but um, low in sodium, high in potassium, high in fiber, and then to make sure that you eat a, a variety of vegetables from all the groups, so dark green leafy vegetables, red and orange, um, leg legumes, starchy um, legumes, um, like beans and peas. Um, and then a variety of fruits and vegetables and whole fruits. So what you want to do is you want to aim for one and a half to two cups of fruits and two to three cups of vegetables a day. Um, I think uh, there was a campaign that was um, a while back and it was eat five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, and now really what the federal government is recommending is nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, and so you think, oh my God, <laughs> that's so many. Um, but you know, if you, if you measure, actually do the measuring, it isn't all that much. Um, so one of the things that you can do to make sure that you're not eating a lot of sodium is to be able to read um, the, uh, the labels. And what we've done, we've got a lot of little activity here, and what we want you to do, we've got um, different foods 
um, that are on, on, your, um, on your tables. And if you guys can take a, you know, spend a little time, take a look at what the food is and, you know, kind of compare with what you've got. And take a look at where, what the, it says sodium. Oh, sorry. Uh, so for the sodium, um, sodium count and do a comparison. So that is about a, tea, a teaspoon of salt a day. So 2,300 milligrams is about a teaspoon. Salt and sodium is the same. Interchangeable, yeah. So how many people read the labels on their food before they purchase it themselves? How many people read the labels before you purchase the food? How many people look at the sodium content in the label that, uh, that makes you decide how you're going to choose your food? So this is something new for many of you, and it's to look at the sodium label. So that's important to point out because a lot of times we buy things and it's like, oh, okay, so it has 400 milligrams. But if you look and it says two servings is in that package or three and a half servings, you eat the whole thing. You have to take those numbers and times it by two or three or three and a half. And that was, that's going to raise your uh, sodium content a lot. Now you need to multiply that 800 by two, two. because the yep. 800 is just for one, one serving. serving. So really yep. there's 1,600 uh -huh. servings. And if you eat that whole thing, you've got almost all your sodium that you need in a yep. day. And ramen is, co is common. I see a lot of people eating it. It doesn't cost that much money. Kids like it. And it's not really a good way to get kids started on eating something that's so high in, in sodium or salt. Did you want to? Um, one thing I wanted to say is, you know, I spent part of my childhood in the South, in Atlanta. And, you know, it gets hot down there. And we used to eat a lot of fruit and a lot of watermelon. I remember that and a lot of watermelon was so nice and cold. But I used to see the adults put salt on the watermelon. And I never understood that because I thought it tasted really good the way it was. But So I started doing the same thing and it tasted good that way too. <laughs> but I as an adult, I stopped doing that. But um, yeah, that's just one thing. And, and another example I'll give is um, just not too long ago, I was running around a lot and I, my doctor had been telling me, okay, Sean, eat more salads and things. I said, fine went by a holiday and you know how they have those pre-made salads grabbed one of those and my doctor would be proud of me and I grabbed one of those little packages of um, salad dressings French dressing and I was like okay you know and I'm eating my salad feeling proud of myself and I happened to look at the back in that little okay let me just back up back up a little bit on this paper it says eat less than 2300 milligrams a day my doctor has me on 1200 milligrams right now okay so that's another thing to your patients that you're working with should ne not necessarily go by this. They should meet with their doctor and or nutritionist and find out what is their daily limit. Because it could be a lot lower than 2,300. But anyways, so I turn and look at the little package of salad dressing. It was 450 milligrams in that one little packet. So then I was like, dang, that made me so mad, you know, because I was <laughs> like trying to make sure I don't go over that daily limit. So I learned, you know, you could take a lemon or a lime and put that on the salad, and it's just as good. It tastes just as good. So it's really important when we're working with our patients, just we should know what the, their alternatives are so we can let them know that they know. Um, my aunt, she just recently had a stroke, and she, uh, bless her heart, <laughs> she just put salt on everything. And she, my cousin was telling me she was taking some low-fat dressing and just drizzling it on her salad, but then she had to be rushed to the hospital because there's blood pressure shot up and found out what she was doing. It was full of sodium. Reading the labels is very important. Low-fat, we, oh, I'm going to get that, but it's high in sodium because we didn't look at that part. Or, you know, no salt added, and you found out it does have salt added, a little bit at least. Um, so reading the labels are very important. And what you're going to find with these two items is that one has a, a, a I didn't, didn't put the prices of what I paid for these, but there's a significant price difference with each one of them. Banquet was like, I don't know if it was 50 cents or a buck or something like that at Walmart. And then the um, smart ones was like three something. So if you've got people 
that are on a budget um, and they've got to decide, um, you know, there needs to be a conversation about um, your health as well and, you know, how you're going to spend your money on your health. Um, so, uh, so, and sometimes that's, that's a hard thing to do, and I'm going to turn it over well, to Sean. I was just going to say, if anybody disagrees with, with me, please tell me, but whenever we buy something in a can or a box or something, it's just, it's just, it has to be suspect. If our patients, if our, us or our patients are trying to watch their sodium, it's much better and sometimes cheaper in the long run to buy the ingredients and make it yourself. Right. You know, buy those, go to the farmer's market or the, you know, produce section and actually buy the green beans and cook it yourself. And then you are in control of how much sodium you put in there. Maybe you don't put in any. My mom has learned to use other spices and other, you know, things that she has to actually cut up and put in there. And she's like, oh, I didn't even need any salt. And I'm like, see, we tried to tell you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's another conversation that we could have with the people that we're working with. So nutritionists are in charge of what we give our patients. Um, and what we're told is the patients are taught by the nutritionists to pay attention to the serving size. And also I've, I've heard them say, to, if you have a can of vegetables, rinse, those, rinse them to get off a, a lot of that excess sodium. Mm -hmm. But you have to, you know, you just can't just get a can and just eat the whole thing. You know, if you have diabetes or something or just, you know, the high blood pressure, give them measuring, you know, these are like, they have them like 88 cents at Walmart. And we've given them to patients, so just measure it out. And that's what you eat, measure, 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 and just pay attention to what you're eating. You know, if we eat, oh, if I could tell this story, then I'll let you answer your, ask your question. There was a patient we were working with. Um, his, so he had diabetes issues though, but he was, um, receiving a certain amount of money and food support from the county. And he, we noticed his numbers were just going out of control. And it turned out that the county had cut his food support by like $150. So he had been going to the dollar store and shopping out of their refrigerated section. And um, we didn't know why his food support was cut so much. So we actually got our legal aid <laughs> legal attorney involved to find out. And it turned out that the county made a mistake and cut his food supports. They, they were wrong in doing that. And also as a result of that, we learned that 200 other people in this county, their support was cut. So as soon as that number that went back up, they started eating healthy again and their numbers got better. I think um, more and more food shelves are being um, uh, conscious of people that have diabetes, a lot of people who have diabetes, hypertension, different chronic diseases. So when they put the word out for food donations that they ask for healthier foods or when they can have the opportunity to order foods that they take a look at healthier foods. I don't know all of them, but I know I've heard that more and more are doing it now. And also an answer to your question too about the food shop. So if you can put your, if you carry your own resources of different places that gave away fresh fruits and vegetables around their neighborhood, that would help a lot. There are a lot of places, churches and places like that, that will have fresh fruits and vegetables in the spring and the summer. And also hook them up with Second Harvest Heartland, because they will contact the patient, help them get on food support if they need, and help them find other resources where they can find more fresh fruits and vegetables. And that just illustrates the importance of really looking at the labels and being able to compare. Because yes, we want to be healthy. So again, you have to, you know, you can't just look at what the marketing, like the, the you know, saying it's uh, calorie free, all these kinds of things, because it isn't necessarily the case. There's these loopholes that um, allow the marketing um, companies to, or the, the, the companies to, I would say not to be quite as truthful as what we would like them to be. So I think it's up to you, the consumer, or your patient, or your client, um, to really take the initiative and to, to be able to read. And again, as Sean said, you know, the best is buying the fresh fruits and vegetables and really cooking it up yourself. Um, and then you can add in, and you don't need to add in the, necessarily the salt, you can add in herbs and spices um, that give the taste that you might be looking for as well. So you know the difference is you, you need to be comparing 
There are, this does illustrate that um, the foods on the table, that there are foods that are similar but lower in sodium. Um, and so that, you know, when you're looking, you may want to choose the one that does have the lower sodium. Um, again, it's important, um, Sean mentioned it, that with your canned food, especially with the, the vegetables or with the like green beans, um, to rinse it. Dump out the water and rinse it. Just don't put it in the kettle and then you're just eating it. But um, make sure that it's a, a clean rinse to get the sodium off of it. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Oh, and then just in general, um, you know, it's really thinking about your health. And I really like the conversation about, you know, growing your own food and, um, you know, the vegetables. And if you can encourage or help people or connect people, you know, some communities have community gardens that maybe you can get in and, and have a little, a little section. Or if your client isn't able to do it, maybe a neighbor would be able to help them. But there's lots of ways, ways to connect. You know, when I was thinking about with the um, salad dressing, you know, it might seem like one to two teaspoons is not a lot. But really, you know, if you, if you measure that out and then take a fork full of salad and just dip it a little bit in the salad and eat it that way, you'll still get all that wonderful taste from the salad dressing without feeling like you have to, um, you know, drench it on the salad. So that's a good something to think about for, our, for the people that we're working with. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that you do, you know, you talk about how you make your salad dressing. When you're working with your patients or clients, um, what are some ways that you already use or, or do with your patients in regards to the eating? Meal planning, those kinds of things? You know, my aunt, she was like, she, think, she was thinking she could take her medication and keep eating the way she was, and it's not like that. You have to do both. You know what I mean? You have to take the medicine on time every day as your doctor prescribed and you have to cut back on the sodium. And I promise, I tell her, I promise you will get used to that. She, everything's so bland. And I promise you're going to get used to it. There will be a period of time where you, something might have a little sodium in it and you're like, oh, that's too salty. You know, when, as opposed to before, she wanted to put salt on everything. So our taste buds do change, it does get better. But it's important for us, our patients to know that taking that medication, sometimes doctors will say, you need, you have high blood pressure, you take this medicine and leave it at that. But see, that's where, as community health workers, we can step in and sit down with the patient and explain to them why it's important. Don't just take it two days a week, you know, I forgot, I don't know, the doctor don't know what he's talking about, you know. <laughs> I hear that all the time and I, you know, I like to sit down and explain, this is what will happen to your body if you don't take this medicine, if your numbers don't come down, you will have a stroke. You will have a heart attack. And my mom, bless her heart, she has come back from her stroke. But there's a lot of people who don't. They don't. They are stuck with that limping or, you know, or whatever. We won't get into that. But it's a real thing. So as community health workers, we can spend more time with our patients and make it real to them and help them figure out how to remember to take the medicines every day on time. And again, yeah, that small changes, those work out in the long run because it becomes a habit then, and it becomes a positive habit when you make the changes. Some other things that you could possibly do when people are ready to make that change is to, um, you know, it's all part of planning. So it's part of, oh, um, uh, maybe what are the next four meals that you're going to have, you know, so thinking ahead. Um, kind of planning so that you're not just grabbing at something that's really easy and you know maybe the chips or whatever and then you're eating that so have a plan and then also maybe they need help with writing out a grocery list like maybe they don't make a list when they go because it's really important then you're not and also don't go shopping when you're super hungry either because you will buy half the store um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, you know, so that you've got your list and then you stick to your list and it just makes it easier to, to stick with that habit. Yeah, it's, it's important, very important. Like this is so much information and I would never take no. all of this and meet with a patient. That would just, yeah, that would, they would shut down immediately. But find out from them what, first of all, do you understand that your blood pressure is high? Do you know why your doctor wants you to bring it down? Do you want to bring it down? And then let them come up with a plan. You know, okay, so what, do you, what are some things that you think you, you can do in order to 
um, you know, bring your numbers down and let them come up with it. If they have buy-in, if they're even leading it and you're just supporting them, the success rate will be higher. So that is very important. Community health workers in here know that we, if we're pulling them, it's just not going to work. You know, but if we're walking with them or letting them lead, then the success rate will be a little higher. Great. Okay. So I think we'll move on. This was a great conversation to a couple of more um, modifiable risk factors, so things that you can change. One is being overweight or obese. Need to lose weight. And um, yes, Cheryl Lee, you need to lose weight. And yes, I want to lose 50 pounds. And I want to lose 50 pounds by two weeks. So is that realistic? No. no. Would I be successful? No. Do I wish it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the best weight loss is between one to two pounds a week. But even if it's a half a pound or if they stay the same, that that's great as well. Um, so again, obesity is a, and, and overweight is a risk factor. Um, I think that people need to be forgiving of themselves. So if you're working at losing some weight and all of a sudden it went up a little bit, you know, just regroup and, and um, be able to forgive yourself and, and move on and get back on track. Um, and I think you as health edu or health, uh, community health workers, um, it, you can be a good role model. So, you know, if you're eating a snack or if you bring a snack along, that it's, it's a healthy snack and not, um, you know, junk food. Uh, lack of physical activity. So movement is really, really important. And, and you can, um, people who are not very physically active, they tend to be overweight. And so the recommendation is at least 30 minutes a day, uh, most days, of some sort of physical activity. Does it have to be the 30 minutes all at once? Not necessarily. You can chunk it out into 10-minute intervals. What are some things that you as community health workers could do when you're with your patients or clients to help promote physical activity? Have a walking meeting? What kinds of suggestions could you talk about with your patients or clients? Yep, I have a patient who I just recently started working with and he has some issues with his knees, but he has the high blood pressure and he wanted to work out more. So he and I talked and he decided that he could start out just by walking to the corner and back. He lived on one end of the block, so he could just walk to that corner and back. And then maybe a couple hours later, he could do it again. And then over time, he agreed that, yeah, he could probably make it around the block, you know, and then he's optimistic that eventually he'll just be moves in on down the road two or three miles. You know, we'll see if he gets to that. But the, he's, I let him lead it, and he decided that, that he could do that, and it counts. It counts. Like you say, if you 30 minutes minimum, if he goes out for 10 minutes three times a day, then he's met that. And I told him he can just add on two minutes on, onto that, and pretty soon he's walking up to an hour. We'll see what happens, but... Again, letting the patient lead. Your client or patient, so if they work every day and they're doing this, this work activity and they need to lose weight, you want to be able to step it up a little bit more. To be out in nature and all those other kinds of things, that's really great because that really helps reduce stress. Um, but sometimes if you add in, add that and say, well, you know, you can give that as a suggestion, but sometimes if you've got really busy families and people working a couple jobs and, and all those kinds of things, just thinking about walking out in the park might just be stressful just thinking about it. So, um, so you know, if you do walking meetings to get people out, but um, I think what it is is when you want to lose, if you're, you're working to lose the weight, you want to step it up a little bit more than what they're doing every day yeah, above and beyond above and beyond what you do so like for me I walk I have a, a it's not a Fitbit it's a Garmin a um, little bit cheaper um, on a budget and um, <laughs> and so I try to monitor at least 10,000 steps a day so now I'm getting you know I get I get between 10 and 15,000 am I losing the weight fast enough no so you know so then I want to make sure that I'm doing you know, even extra things as well. But, but again, I can't stress, I, I've been seeing more and more research about people getting out in parks um, and doing nature walks and things like that. 
just what it does for people's well-being. And you know, if you have families that are really stressed and, um, and, and they need to think about doing, instead of just laying down on the couch, that maybe they would want to consider taking you know, their family members or a friend and then just going you know, to walk to the park or through the park or take a little trip um, you know, to go to a special park that it's really important. I mean, that can really help with the well-being, you know, just how you feel. When we talk about the strength exercises, take the couple of cans. You know, you can do some things. You can do some exercises in the chair. We don't want you dropping cans on your feet, especially people that have, you know, diabetes and, and they might not have good feeling in their feet, so you might want to use um, bags of rice. But um, those, uh, if you have, uh, I, I remember um, people that with uh, the laundry detergent and so having a couple of things and so they were doing squats and things with the laundry detergent as the liquid as well. What's nice about the Y is that sometimes um, people can't work out on the, the machines. Maybe they can walk on the track indoors, um, but they have a pool and sometimes just the water aerobics or just the movement, you know, little classes in the pool really help people, especially if they have some mobility um, problems with their knees and joints. Another modifiable factor is smoking. How many people have patients or clients that use tobacco or smoke? Okay, so you have a few of those. It's really, really hard for people to quit smoking. I mean, it takes a number of attempts and it makes and people really need to do it. So um, one of the things that uh, that you could you could offer to people if you, if the the physician if their doctor hasn't done it is there's call it quits, um, and so that there's a telephone counseling line if people want to um, be able and then they send some um, nicotine replacement therapy um, that you can use along with that if your if your physician didn't offer that to them. Um, what are some, what, what, you know, people don't want to quit. What are some, what, what do you do? Be soft about it, but be consistent. And so, you know, just checking. We want to know how you're doing. We care about your health. Um, you know, what, what are some things that you'd maybe think about trying on a scale from one to 10? What would be something that you would want to try or that you think that you could quit? or you would want to quit. I'm not gonna, that's a whole session in itself on tobacco. We're not going to go into it, but what we wanted to do is just to make sure that you knew about the resource Call It Quits. Um, and again, it'll be part of the resource links that, that we um, sent to you. And the last one is, what do you think? Drinking, using alcohol. One of the things in regards to drinking is that um, for adults, for men, um, they should uh, limit it to two drinks a day, and for women, at least one drink a day. Okay, so um, so when we talk about a drink, we want to make sure that we measure that drink um, because that gets to be part of the problem with thinking about how much drink or alcohol that we have. So this is a little shot glass. So this would be like for harder alcohol like whiskey or brandy or whatever. This is an ounce. And um, so we just wanted to show it to you. And this is a, uh, do, it, just pour it in here. So this is a, a glass. So just so you can see that you don't fill it up halfway um, with the brandy or the whatever else. And then add in whatever else because that's going to be more than one drink, okay, one serving. Uh, this is a, a beer glass, and this is going up to this line here is 12 ounces. And so that's for one beer. And sometimes you get these, these beer bottles that are 16 ounces or 32 ounces. So it's not the bottle, it's the ounces, 12 ounces. And then lastly, what I wanted to show you is, um, so this is a wine glass, and I poured in a serving of wine. Okay, so it goes up to here. I remember the first time, this was a long time ago, I went to a restaurant and ordered a glass of wine, and they came out with this, and I thought, 
I thought they were ripping me off because I thought it should be the full amount. But really, this is what one serving of wine is. I guess they, yeah, you can take it around. And I guess what it is, it's so it can breathe. I, there's lots of things that go into it that I don't really know that much about. Um, but I just thought I'd show it to you because it's very, very important to just know, again, the serving size um, of what you drink. You know, if people are on medications, it's really good to just encourage them not to drink at all. And again, if we say, you know, okay, some people think, oh, okay, well, if I could have one drink a day, okay, so I don't drink Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday, oh, I saved it up and I can have five or six drinks. <laughs> that doesn't work, and that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> You know, so these are the modifiable risk factors that people can really, um, you know, change and, and to work on for themselves in regards to lowering their blood pressure and, make, you know, uh, making sure that they stay healthy. And it's just not for blood pressure, it's for life in general, too, but especially for people with high blood pressure. Now, um, I just wanted to spend a minute on modifiable... Or, um, non-modifiable risk factors. So we kind of talked about it. Somebody said family history. It could be gender. It could be um, age. It could be race and ethnicity. One of the things that we don't have good data on is the immigrant community. So if you're Latino or if you're Somali, we just don't have good data for your population on it. So we, so we just don't have it. It's the, it's the way that they've been collecting the data. But what we do know is that when immigrants come into the country, generally they're fairly healthy, but when they've been here for about five years and been eating our diet, it goes down. And so um, we want to make sure that, um, you know, when people come over that they should, you know, really stick with the healthy eating um, that they can and not adopt the American diet. So what I'm going to do is um, okay. go through some of the answers. I know that um, when people get talking and having this great discussion, we don't always get all the blanks filled in in the handout. So I'm going to go through those answers for you so you at least get, go home with them. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hopefully. So we're going to start on page five. The word says high blood pressure basics. Um, only about half of all people with high blood pressure have it under control. Um, the second blank is 1.1 million. And then 77% of people with high blood pressure report taking medicine to control it. And then about 75% of people under the blood pressure is recorded as two numbers. The first blank is systolic pressure. The second one is diastolic. And then going on to page six, silent killer. In that paragraph, high blood pressure is also known as the silent killer. I guess this is a good review of everything we've talked about today. So. <laughs> And then in that next paragraph where it's talking about symptoms, that last blank is to determine the cause. So if someone has experienced the things in that paragraph, they really should see a provider to determine the cause. All right, then page seven, um, as Sherry Lee was going through all of the modifiable risk factors. Um, the first one, uh, clients you work with should understand why it's important to eat less salt. And then under the recommendations, um, eat less than 2,300 milligrams. And you can put in parentheses one teaspoon. One teaspoon. Thank you. Yeah, okay. one teaspoon. One teaspoon. Well, no, that's not a teaspoon. Um, one and a half to two cups of fruits and two to three cups of vegetables. One and one half cup, one and a half to two cups of fruits and two to three cups of vegetables a day. Right, then going down into the tips section, the first um, point there, uh, the first blank is 5% is low, 20% of 
of the daily value is high. The second point, um, three to four meals to make for the week, and write out the grocery list. Grocery list. The third point, um, offer suggestions of healthier foods to eat. And then the last one, it's kind of, I have a bunch of things here. Um, so if they don't say they have time, really you could fill in with some of the discussion you have. Um, pack a lunch the night before. Planning meals that use similar ingredients. Make a list before going to the store and sticking to it. I know Shirley talked about that. that uh, <laughs> don't go when you're hungry. And don't, yeah, and don't go when you're hungry. <laughs> All right. So then page eight. Is everyone ready? Or? Yeah. All right. So page eight, um, under the recommendation, it's um, about one to two pounds each week. And then under tips, the first point, um, you want to be forgiving, we're not perfect. So it's remember that goals should be specific, realistic, and forgiving. When Sherry Lee was talking about, I know I need to lose thir or 30 pounds. 50. 50, oh, sorry. <laughs> 50. <laughs> forgiving, and we don't need to be perfect. Um, the second one, um, if their budget allows and there's a convenient location, you could suggest things like Weight Watchers or the YMCA. Or tops, Top. tip off oh, pounds yep. sensibly. Yep. And sometimes, um, depending on the insurance, their insurance will pay for them to meet with nutritionists regularly. Yep. So their yep. insurance could pay for it. Yeah. And then the last tip under um, overweight and obese, encourage healthy eating. Then under, oh, is everyone ready to move on to physical activity? Mm -hmm. All right. So under the recommendations, uh, be active for at least 30 minutes most days. And then under tips, the first one really gets um, to the question the gentleman asked in the back. Um, it's above and beyond their normal living. So when you're talking with patients, it's above and beyond. Uh, that second point, um, if they have a chronic health condition, like heart disease or arthritis, um, have them talk to their uh, provider before they would start a physical activity routine. The third point, um, I know Shirley did discuss this, I'm breaking it up into like 10 minutes at a time is fine. And I know someone else made that comment too, little chunks. And then let's see, one, two, three. The fourth point, it's each time you visit a client, um, suggest physical activity. You know, I put in here such as stretching exercises or going for a walk. And the last one there is um, I give them a map if one is available. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you could give them a pedometer too if one is available. That's true. Now we're under tobacco. Um, so the first one under tips is call it quits. That's a referral program. So then the second one, um, if someone smokes, you know, talk to them about their readiness yep. to quit. And then the third point, um, you can offer them resources such as the quit plan. So yes, that is still a viable option. And if they're interested, you can assist them in making the call. You can help them make the call. The call. And then under alcohol, drinking too much alcohol, I think the only blank we had was under the tip. Um, encourage people to limit how much alcohol they drink. So now, um, non-modifiable risk factors, age, blood pressure tends to go up as people get older, 
And then under family history, families share genes and environments. Environment, right? So if everyone eats, you know, who's doing the cooking, where they live, those types of things. Environments. And I think that is the last one. And we're caught up. So thank you. We have another activity. And we're going to create what's called a healthy habits flower. So you should see something like this with the green circle in the middle on page 10, hopefully. So what you're going to do is put your name in the middle in the green section. And then you're going to draw little, um, little petals. And in each petal, you're going to write um, you're going to write a healthy habit. For example, one that I put from last time we did this was monitor your blood pressure with a home blood pressure machine and keep track of those numbers and then bring them to your doctor. So basically I wrote monitor your pressure and keep track to show doctor. That's one healthy habit that a person could use to um, regarding their blood pressure. So just come up with some other ones and and then we'll share at the end with, you know, find out what, what you guys come up with. And this is, an act, this is an activity that you could possibly do with your patient or client. Um, uh, you know, just this a little artsy kind of thing to get people just thinking and, and um, thinking about healthy habits. So in the petals, so when you, get here, you want to you put healthy awesome habits yep. in regards to the blood pressure. So. You might put eat foods high in potassium in one of the petals. And another one you could put, you know, exercise at least 30 minutes a day. So this is what mine, what mine um, looks like. So what we're going to do is move into the role of the community health worker. Okay. And since you all, as community health workers or about to be graduated community health workers, um, you're a trusted and valued member of the community that you serve and that you support. The support that you give to others is going to make a really great impact on the people that you serve and on their health. And this is uh, true for all people you work with, not just the ones that, you've, that have already been diagnosed with high blood pressure, because promoting heart health and preventing high blood pressure are lifelong processes, and you can support people in all ages um, in leading healthier lives. So the Minnesota Department of Health Statewide Health Improvement Program, SHIP, um, a number of years back, develop this framework um, to more or less simplify as community health workers, as public health folks, um, become more involved with clinical um, operations. And so we, we have this framework is called screen, counsel, refer, <coughs> follow-up. It's fairly easy to remember. It's got most of the points of you working with um, patients and, and clients. And so for the first one, when we talk about screening, we want to make sure to let adults know that they should be screened. So you may not necessarily be doing the screening, but you want to make sure that, um, that they should be screened for high blood pressure. And this is especially important because many people with high blood pressure don't even know it. And we talked about it being the silent killer. You know, I feel fine. The recommendations, again, are adults that are uh, 40 years or uh, older and persons that maybe in, have, are, incre are at risk of um, increased high blood pressure should be screened every year. So when we say at risk, that means that they might have familial um, uh, issues um, or their age or their gender. Um, if screening happens outside of the clinic, a system needs to be in place so that the blood pressure reading gets back to the clinic. So what we're talking about is when you, you know, I, maybe I went to the fire department and, and got my, you know, because those guys um, do a blood pressure. How would you get that back to the clinic? I think you take the car that, that they give you and take it to your doctor. But okay. I think it's difficult if you're outside, uh, it seems to be taking blood pressure outside uh, to get information back across the HIPAA and all the other kinds mm -hmm. of things. So the recommendation is, is to, to have that documented and make sure the patient um, says something to the doctor. But, um, so that conversation needs, needs to happen. 
Um, and then the last thing is to understand um, how people might be using the home blood pressure monitor because more and more what's happening is that um, uh, people are, the, they actually they've become um, less expensive and um, they're out there more and so more people have access to home blood pressure monitors. And um, so it's important for you to understand that these do exist how they're used, and then um, to assist people in case they're, they've got one at home and, and you can tell them. And so now I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so I am not a medical assistant. I have not been trained on how to take people's blood pressure. I just wanted to put this out here. I work at a clinic, and that's where I'm, you know, I'm not allowed to go to people's homes. Like my coworkers at MVNA over there, I really admire you guys for that. Um, but I use one of these myself at home, and I have family members who do. So if a patient was, you know, able to spend the twenty to thirty dollars to get one at Walmart or Target or, or wherever, um, <laughs> um, if I was training someone on how to use it themselves, this is what I would do. And honestly, if you guys have any if, any, if I say anything wrong or if I forget something, please feel free to tell me. But this is what I do for me. So I'm going to do it on her. That's right. Okay. And in your folder, it's either green or red. I don't know. We had like four different colors. There's a sheet that's, that talks about um, home blood pressure monitoring. So it'll talk about the things that Sean is going to demonstrate. Okay. So Mary Jo, we're going to take your blood pressure today using your own personal um, monitor. Okay. First, what you want to do is make sure before you take your blood pressure, you want to sit quietly for about five to ten minutes before you take it. You want to sit with your both feet flat on the ground and just relax. Okay. And which arm would you like me to? Um, my my right arm. Your, please. Okay. So if you can just take off your sweater, if that's okay. Sure. I think. Okay. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this on your arm and it closes with Velcro. Okay. And um, you want to make sure that this rubber thingy mm -hmm. <laughs> um, goes flat or is, is face flat against your, your arm like this. I don't okay. know. I know there's a term for that, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, okay, so cool. we're going to just loosely Velcro this to your arm. Okay. 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 So you just sit and relax, okay. and when I hit this button, button's going to come on and it's going to just gently squeeze your arm for a few seconds. Some numbers are going to show up on here, and then it'll beep and it'll tell us what your blood pressure is, okay? Okay. Okay, do you have any questions before I get started? No. Okay, so I'm going to hit this button. So it does take a few seconds um, uh, to get it, to read it. Okay, so your numbers are 114 over 73. Is that good or bad? Well, actually, that's pretty good, and I'll show you what, um, I will show you what those numbers are mean. So I'll just go ahead and take this off. How did that feel? Did it hurt or anything? Or No, but it really squeezed pretty it squeezed tight. Pretty I was surprised tight, yeah. how tight it <laughs> felt on my arm. And then um, <laughs> would you, just to turn it off, you just, just hit that button okay. and it'll turn off, okay? All right, so what I want to do is show you um, what those numbers mean. Should have. Okay, so Normal is below 120 over 80, which is what yours was, so good for you. Okay. okay. If your numbers were 120 to 139 over like 80 to 90, then that's called prehypertension. Okay. So it's not hypertension, but it means it's just creeping up there and you just want to make some you know, diet changes, maybe exercise a little bit more. Okay. And then high blood pressure is 140 or above over 90. So if that's, that's the case, you really want to see your doctor talk to your doctor about it, maybe she's, she would um, possibly um, to prescribe some medications for you. But you don't have to worry about that, your numbers are good. So I'm gonna leave this with you. Okay. Okay, just so when you, when you take your blood pressure again, tomorrow or the next day, you can um, 
refer to this and make sure it stays. And okay. one thing I want to encourage you to do is we're going to, I'm going to leave a little log with you. I would like you to, every time you take your blood pressure, write okay. the date and the time okay. and then write those numbers down. And then when you go see your doctor, you bring that with you. Okay. So if your numbers start to creep up a little bit, your doctor, you and your doctor can talk about that and see what's going on. Okay, that okay. sounds good. All right. And there's a sample log also in your packet. <laughs> Sometimes they give out those little cards that you can hardly read and yeah. you're trying to squeeze everything in because, you know, it's the wallet card. Mm -hmm. And generally what we like, especially if you're working with older clients or patients, um, if they're writing it down, there really needs to be more space. And, and so the log that we have is, is, is a little bit bigger than what you would normally see. And I like to, you know, I'm not afraid to just use myself in, as, as an example. I mean, I've made changes in my life and my numbers are coming down. And, you know, so I'm tracking it. I keep it on my phone. And then, um, and then I'll just bring it to me to the to bring it to the doctor, and we could see that at one point the numbers weren't changing. So she had to, you know, change a dosage, and we had to change instead of taking everything in the morning, take something in the morning and then rest at night, you know. And so then I started seeing the numbers come down. So you can explain to the patient or your client that um, that's how your doctor is going to know. I mean, we think doctors are awesome. Of course, we love them, but they only know as much as we're going to tell them. Do you know what I mean? So that's why it's important to keep track of those numbers and bring that piece of paper to the doctor. So, thank you. Um, one of the other things I wanted you to share is your little story about um, just thinking about high blood pressure when you've got, when maybe doing pre-visit planning oh, or, yes. or things with the patients. So. Yes. Yeah, so when I first became a community health worker, I... I, first of all, I absolutely love what I do. And, you know, we have a food shelf there, and it's like, oh, do you want a food? You know, do you want food? Do you want this? And everything that I could think of, I'd want to talk to the patient about. But I started just, as I got more um, comfortable in my role, I started paying attention to what the client was working on with the doctor. So I wanted to take care of all the social stuff, you know, the homeless and the food shelf and all that stuff. But then I started looking at the after visit summary and I could see okay my this patient has high blood pressure did you talk to the doctor about that oh yeah I gotta pick up my medicine so then I started um, really working with the patient with that about that and letting them see that it really is important it's just not another pill the doctor wants you to take this is why it's important this is why it's important to track your numbers and to do what the doctor suggests so um, I'm, as a result of this training, I have to say that I am meeting with my patients a little bit differently than I used to. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, was the, that was the story that I wanted. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And that moves into um, when we talk about counseling, about um, you know working with your patient, um, little tips that you can give your patient, things to focus on. And in regards to uh, high blood pressure or just their blood pressure, things that you can encourage um, your patients or, or clients to feel you know, to help them feel comfortable to talk to their doctor, to ask their doctor. Um, so let's say asking their doctor for a copy of the blood pressure numbers. You know, do they have that? Is that part of the after visit summary? You know, different after visit summaries are, are, are different for each um, organization. Is it on there? If it's not on there, do they feel comfortable about asking? What do their blood pressures mean? And you can role play with your patients or clients. You can pretend that you're the doctor and then they can ask you um, the questions that, because the more that you, you role play, then the easier it gets when they're, when they're in the office. Um, and then what, their goal, what should be the goals for the blood pressure? So does the doctor have some goals? And then you as the, um, you as the community health worker can help that patient figure out just in general what their goals in life are of what they want to do so that then they can really, um, you know, really internalize it and work on it, not just, oh, well, I got to get my blood pressure down to 120 over 80. Well, that's really, really important, but, oh, I, you know, I'm overweight, so I've got to lose weight, and I've, I smoke, and I've got to quit smoking. Oh, my God, it's so overwhelming. I, I don't even care anymore. So you want to be able to break it down, but you also want people to th think about, for their health, what do they want it, What do they want to do? And so I, I, I um, for some of my work, um, when uh, healthcare homes came in, and um, and wanted to uh, re or are requiring that there's care plans and the patient goals, 
Um, it was very interesting as the people were making that shift that, oh, okay, well, it's just not lose 50 pounds, make sure my blood pressure is this, my cholesterol, you know, all, just those numbers. Important to know the numbers, but what do I want? Well, I want to be able to travel to visit my children. So what do I need to do to make sure, oh, if my blood pressure is too high, I might not be, able, be comfortable on the airplane or I might not be able... Um, you know, to do the traveling that I want to do. So make it something that, that I can strive for that's meaningful for me as well. Um, encourage people, your patients or clients, to discuss with their doctor how often should they be checking their blood pressure in between the visits. So, you know, is there, should they be getting, should the doctor order a home blood pressure monitor? Some insurances cover it, some don't. Um, you know, where could they problem solve, where could they get their blood pressure taken so that they could uh, jot those numbers down. And then make a plan about what to do if their blood pressure is, is too high. You know, doctor can give you some suggestions, but you as the community health worker can also work on helping to support that plan. Um, people, you can talk to people about making, the, we talked about this, the healthy lifestyle choices, the fruits, the vegetables, physical activity, um, limiting alcohol. Explain to people the importance of uh, keeping their blood pressure at a healthy le level. Um, and that it can also, you know, we talked about the arteries, but um, it, it can have a negative effect on other parts of their body, like their eyes, like their heart, like their brain, like their kidneys. And teach people with high blood pressure to keep a log book or, or a wallet card if they can write in those little things. And then um, assist with setting the nutrition, physical activity, and so smoking cessation goals. And understand the basics of the DASH diet. Okay, so the DASH diet is, uh, is promoted, uh, CDC promotes it. I think we have a copy of, in there, of it in, in, your, um, in your packets. I'm not going to go over it. We talked a lot about nutrition. Do you will go underneath that assist with setting again? Oh, uh, setting nutrition, physical activity, or smoking cessation goals. Yeah, so explain to people the importance of keeping their blood pressure at a healthy level. And, um, and then you can also explain to them about how an elevated blood pressure can have a negative effect on different parts of the body that could include the eyes heart, brain, kidneys, to name a few. Did everybody get that? What was those the settings are nutrition, setting nutrition, physical activity, or smoking cessation goals. OK, so the next is, um, is refer. And, and we talked a little bit about the Call It Quits program. We talked a little bit about um, Quit Plan for the tobacco. But I think um, what's really important is that, you know, in the clinic, people can't do it all themselves. And there are programs out there um, that can help people. There's the, there's, uh, there's, they have different names, but like the Chronic Disease Self-Management Program the Diabetes Prevention Program. And again, some of those will be in our, that, that'll be part of our, our resource link. Um, but those kinds of programs are really important because it's a group, it's group learning. Um, they meet other people that might have similar uh, things going on. And, um, you know, sometimes they make friends. I know some of the groups that we think, oh, if I refer them and this is a year-long group and they're never going to participate all we're very surprised because people who really get into it, they, they want to do it, they stick with it, and then they get, they, they get sad when the group ends and they want to move forward. And when they make friends, then you know, they can buddy up and, and be able to support one another. It's important when there is a referral that happens um, to make sure that, that, um, uh, you know, that the patient or the, the client um, that they know how to get there, you know, that they've got a plan, of, they're going to get a ride, or they have a babysitter, they're able to bring their kids, um, you know, just that planning to get to a program and have that time for them. 
Um, and then the last thing is to uh, assist to assist uninsured people to find ways to pay for their health care. So, for example, helping them get signed up for different health care programs or, or health insurance is very important. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary sure. Jo for the last one in regards to follow-up. Sure. So, again, um, with the follow-up, as Shirley said, you know, when you refer someone, it's really taking that next step. It's not just having the, giving them their after visit summary and sending them out, out the door because we know what happens with a lot of those after visit summaries. They get left on the desk, they get tossed in the recycling. Um, so we really want to follow up, put some follow up systems in place. Um, what are some things that you think you could do to follow up with patients or some things that you do? currently do with patients or your clients? Just give them a call and find out, you know, when their appointment is. Yeah, so like a reminder call. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, that's a great thing. Um, if, as they're leaving, you know, if you're in a clinic setting and they're leaving that clinic, you can schedule that appointment with them before they leave. And then, yes, that reminder call a few days before, I think, is really critical to get people back in. Anyone else? What else do people do for? So my client, I make, I make the right appointment for them. So you already have a right in, in place, so we know the Great. You know, but oh. so going over there after visit summary, but one thing I wanted to say before I forget, you know, some of us have patients who um, they can't read. You know, they can't. And, you know, the doctor will say, you know, do you understand? And they're like, yes, but really they don't. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I became a community health worker, it was so shocking to learn there are people whose first language is not English, so they can't read in English or in their own language, you know, and you have to be really creative. With, and I say that to say I have one patient who um, his first language is English, but he didn't understand what neurology is or the neurologist, so I say, okay, now you're going to the brain doctor. And then if he has cardiology, okay, now today you're going to the, to the heart doctor. Um, there's a you know, a doctor put in a referral for him to go to the cancer center to have his blood checked. It has nothing to do with cancer, but do I have cancer? I was like, no, you know, and I had to explain to him, doctor just wants to check your blood, and that's where they do that kind of test, whatever that is. So um, I would just say, make it personal. Make sure they, they understand and do a teach back method. You know, tell them and then have them explain it back to you to make sure that they really understand it. Yep, no, mm -hmm. that's great, Sean, thanks. Um, yeah, so it's really, Kind of to jump off on that, it's helping the patients if they're not making appointments, if they don't understand, it's really identifying those barriers, um, and then helping them come up with solutions so that they can get to that appointment. They may not have, as Shirley said, they may not have transportation, so does your organization offer bus tokens and that type of thing? So really working with them to um, work on those solutions. Um, you want to remind people about their medications. Um, Take them as prescribed. I know there's a, a lot of people that, again, they think they feel, I feel great. Why do I need to take medications? I know Sean talked about that a little earlier today. I feel fine. I don't need to take it. Or, you know, I'll just take it um, every other day because that's a good way for me to stretch that 30-day yeah. um, prescription yeah. to, you know, to that. six weeks instead of four weeks. Because, again, um, some people don't understand the importance of taking those medications. Um, other things you can do around, are there other things you can do around medications? Other things you can help clients and patients with? I have another yeah, example. Yeah, sure. So I learned an elderly woman that I work with, she wasn't taking, I think it's called Seroquel, that was prescribed to her by her psychiatrist, and I don't remember why, she told me she wasn't sleeping well, and I was looking through her chart, and I was like, well, I see the doctor prescribed this new medicine. How's it working? Oh, I'm not taking that, Sean. And I was like, why? And she said, she said the, the, the list of things that could go wrong is so long. I said, I'm scared to take it. So I, I said, okay, is it okay if I have a nurse call you? And, and I did, and um, the nurse called and explained, like, every medicine you take is going to have a list of things that could go wrong, and she explained the benefits. And, the last visit, the patient did tell me she's been taking it. She's been sleeping very well. So I, I love the fact that as community health workers, we can get things out of our patients that the doctors have no idea, you know. So, um, yeah. yeah, that was my thing. Yeah. No, that's great. And you want to then 
you know, share that information. If you're working in a clinic setting yes, and you definitely. find that information during a huddle or whatever your clinic might call like a pre-visit planning to make sure that that information gets back to the providers because it can help them plan their care. Um, some other, oh, I think yeah. too when, uh, when a person goes to a doctor or talks to the nurse or something, they got more of a defense mechanism up or sealed up. Could be. And whereas when they're, if they're talking with a community health worker, you're more or less, they more or less feel like they're talking with a friend. Yeah. So they're going to open up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah, just last right. week, the same woman, there's this test she had to do called 24 hours something where she had to urinate in a jug or something for 24 hours. I can't remember what it's called. But anyways, the nurse came in, to, and I stayed in the room too, the nurse came in to do the teaching, went over it with her about three times. As soon as the nurse left, she said, Sean, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I did, I took a piece of paper and I put it on the wall and wrote Sunday with the box. And I wrote number one, and I told her what she's supposed to do with the first time she goes to the bathroom in the morning. And then I went through that. And then the next, you know, and then that night. And so I drew it out in a picture for her. And I had her explain it back to me and then let the next, um, later that night, I called her again, and do you remember what you're supposed to do? And she, I got your pictures right here, and she told me what she was supposed to do. So, yeah, I, I love my job, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be creative, I'm telling you. You have to be creative. That's good. Yep, and those of us that aren't CHWs greatly appreciate everything you do, too, because it makes everyone else's job much better. Um, so other things, again, around medications, I mean, you can help them make a list of the medications that they're taking. Um, some people, as Sean was saying, they don't know what they're taking. They don't know how often or why. So to help them, you know, write it down. And then if there's barriers to them taking, um, to taking the meds and they need more, maybe they need more education, um, you can get them back to um, their doctor, nurse practitioner, the pharmacist to help, uh, help them understand those medications more. Why are you taking it? You know, maybe they have three prescriptions for the same medication. You know, one's for this many milligrams and one's for that many while well, I was in the hospital and they changed and medications are very complicated. I mean, and I'm sure all of you see that every day in your work, how complicated patients' uh, medications can be. Um, so again, problem solving some of those barriers. Um, Sean talked about using her phone to track. I can't remember what you said. You put something in my your phone. Blood pressure oh, your numbers. blood pressure in the in phone. phone yeah. um, but they can set reminders. So if people are forgetting to take their pills, oh, I always forget. You know, if they have a phone, maybe they help them set an alarm on their phone. Um, there's pill boxes that patients can use. We did um, put a, a, an exa a sample of a pill box in your bag. Um, so you can use that for teaching and, you know, have them either with a, a nurse or the clinic or someone can help them set up their pillboxes or a family member. Um, so again, that can help them uh, remember. Um, refills, again, it's that same thing. Oh, I forget to get the refill. So there's things you can do to help them do that. Um, help them make that call to the pharmacy. If you're going over that list and you say, oh, your blood pressure medicine, you only have two pills left. Let's call the pharmacist and get that refill done. That's something that you can do with them. Um, depending on your job and where you work, um, you may be able to go to the pharmacy with them to fill that up. And then you're another set of ears listening to those instructions. So as the pharmacist is you know, telling them how to take it, do you understand? And again, they're nodding, yes, yes. You're there to hear, and then you can follow up. You know, did you, get, did you really understand what they say? Tell me what he told you. How do you take this? Again, that follow-up. Um, we'll kind of switch gears. Or does anyone have any comments on what they do around medications or any other tips or tricks that you use? No? I think everyone's sweating. No, <laughs> it's really warm in here, and I'm always freezing, and I'm even warm. Um, so I'm going to change gears a little bit here. Um, one other thing, some of the things you can do, which I, uh, Sherry Lee talked about, is with meal planning, um, making grocery lists, um, helping them measure their food. Um, we have a food scale in your bag, so people can see if it says five ounces. Well, you know, I don't know how much, you know, how much is five ounces. So we've got a food scale um, that you can use with clients. There's also other things. Um, I would think if you go online, you can look, you know, like 
a chicken breast should be the size of a deck of cards. So there's tips and tricks like that that you can um, use with people with real objects. You know, a half a cup is the size of a tennis ball. And, and you'd be surprised if you even yourself go home and start measuring um, your food mm -hmm. that you eat or like even we were talking about the, the potato chip bag and putting mm -hmm. in the servings. Okay, if that bag says there's 11 servings and I'm going to put my 11 baggies out and divide it up, you'd be surprised at the less amount of food <laughs> that you think a serving is. And so yeah. it's really, really important yeah. if you're not used to that to weigh, to measure, and to separate out for servings. Yep, that's very true. It's disappointing. Too. It is disappointing, <laughs> I know. I had an example. We were having chicken one night, so I said something about, it should to my kids, it should be about the size of a deck of cards. And then the next night, we had a treat. My daughter likes beef, so I did a little thing on the grill. And I said, remember, deck of cards. And she said, no, I'm going to use this deck. And she brought out a deck of cards that was about this big. It was like one of those old, like, old maid. I can't, old maid thank you. It was an old maid deck that they played when they were like three years. I said, no, that's not really what I meant. <laughs> but you know, so people are creative, so no small deck of cards. Um, which, um, the after visit summary, Sherry Lee brought that up. So if a patient does bring that home, um, you can review it with them and maybe highlight some of the key things. Some of the after visit summaries are very long and very complicated. So really, what are the key things, the key takeaways on that sheet? Um, if they don't bring it home, if you know they've gone, had an appointment and you ask, oh, do you have your after visit summary and they don't, you know, a gentle reminder, well, if you bring that home with you the next time we get together, let's go over it and we'll mark off the, the highlights. Um, again, I think we've kind of talked about this one quite a bit, but at each visit, you know, ask about the goals that they've set. Um, if they set one around nutrition, physical activity, or tobacco, you know, ask them how they're doing. Um, offer that encouragement and support. If they've, you know, they say, oh, I kind of backslid. Again, identify those barriers. You know, what happened this week? Well, I had to work three extra shifts. You know, so that got in the way of me exercising. So then you know, work with them to get back on track, identify those barriers, and help them come up with solutions to keep moving forward. And, um, you know, celebrate. When they reach a goal, it's really important to celebrate. We say, you know, don't celebrate with you know, candy. But, you know, there's other ways. There's other ways you can celebrate. Um, Maybe they like, I don't know, can go to a movie or I don't know other things, but really congratulate them. And again, uh, with the example that Sean was talking about, um, if you notice something and you're hearing something um, you know, in their home or in the visit, talk to the healthcare team about that so that they're aware of what's going on. Again, you're, there, you're the eyes and ears and you can bring that information back to the clinic, back to your organization, and really help that patient um, get the care that they need. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so great. Do you want to talk about some resources? Um, Sean's going to talk about some community resources. So um, where are some places that you think people can get their blood pressure done for free? Yep. Yeah. Walmart. Walmart does it. Mm -hmm. If you want to pass those around, do you want me to help? Donation centers, blood drives, um, pardon, public health, mm -hmm. and even at their clinics. Sometimes they'll just, you know, patient wants their blood pressure taken real quick, a nurse will stop what they're doing and do it. So, yep, that's good. And then it says identify resources to address high blood pressure risk factors. So, um, I know we talked about the DASH diet and Weight Watchers and taking pounds off Taking off pounds sensibly is also called TOPS. Um, talked about tobacco smoking cessation, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, regarding physical activities, people can join curbs if they can afford it, take walks on our trails. We, I don't know if you guys know that, but Minneapolis has like the best park system in the country. So, you know, people really, more of us should be taking taking advantage of that. I don't know if people understand that, but we are very lucky to have the park systems that we do. Um, I like to point out regarding physical activity also, so you know through Minneapolis community education, like they'll have classes at different elementary or high schools, but it's for adults. 
And a lot of those times, those classes, whether they exercise or whatever, they are anywhere between, you know, 15 to $50 for eight week class. And depending on the insurance, a person can get a discount on um, or some kind of a scholarship to take those classes. So that's an, that's an option too for our patients. So it's Minneapolis Community Education. And I did the, the school district. So um, each of the wherever you live. So say, it could be St. Paul. It could be yeah, um, yeah. Bloomington has it. Richfield. So depending on what's, what where the person the patient lives, there'll be a community education program. You can go online and look at the classes, or you can have a, one of those little booklets sent to you, one of those little flyers. They'll have a list of all the classes. Sometimes they're like cooking classes, um, dancing. If you want to learn how to crochet, but for our purposes, we want <laughs> more physical activity. So that's a way for a person to have more physical activity and not have to pay a lot. So what Deb was saying is that there's um, additional resources out there. Uh, the library, um, so the library cards are free. You can rent, um, you know, tape, uh, DVDs or whatever to maybe you want to do some exercise in your home. Um, and then there's also different kinds of activities even in the library. And then Fair for All, Fair for All right? Fair for All is um, a program that's, uh, you can look up on United Way 211 that, that they would give the sites or just do an internet search for Fair for All to see where the location is um, closest to where your patient lives. That uh, it's uh, once a month and it's um, like 12, 12 or I don't know, I guess it varies. It's not very expensive. And you get uh, quite a bit of food and you can have different packages of the food and they have fresh fruits and vegetables along with it as well. Oh, and don't forget about regarding the physical activity, the Nice Ride program. So, you know, you see those green bikes all over the place. And the, if you rent them for 29 minutes or less, it's free. So you don't have to, you're not end up paying anything. If your patients can afford it, if they take it out for an hour, that's gonna be like $4. And then you can get on a monthly program. It's really cheap. So that's something to think about too. So people can um, ride bike. They might not have one at home, but they can use those bikes anywhere and just leave it at a different docking station if they want. Great. Well, we really appreciate you taking the. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time. We know it's a lot to um, come for a full afternoon. Some of you drove from a long ways away, and it's much appreciated. Somebody took the bus, or a couple took the bus, took them a whole hour to bus. get here. Yep, so we appreciate that. And again, complete your evaluations, and you'll get your certificate of attendance as you leave. Thank you. Thank you very much.